من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ثم ما بعد once again, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Inshallah Ta'ala, I was, I was given the topic of Ramadan in the Quran, and there's actually only one ayah of Ramadan in the Quran, uh, and it's situated, as all of you probably know, in Surah Al Baqarah. In our regular series of the Durus on Surah Al Baqarah, I spent quite some time on this ayah and discussed some of the background behind it. But this session, Inshallah, I hope to do three things. Some of it is review from previous Durus. But I do hope to do three things. One, I hope to share with you the placement of this ayah. This ayah is in the latter, the second half of Surah Al-Baqarah. And there's a logical progression. The story begins from the beginning of Baqarah and we reach this point when Ramadan is given to the Ummah. So I want to share with you how we get to this point in this surah, how Allah Azza wa Jal builds the argument and finally reveals to us this incredible gift. And then the second thing I'd like to do with you is share with you certain insights about the ayah itself. And then the third thing I'd like to share with you is a, a tip, essentially a, a clue Allah gave us of how to take the most advantage of Ramadan. And that's the, that'll be the third thing I'd like to share with you. So let's begin at the top. Surah Al-Baqarah is basically divided into two halves. The first half overwhelmingly deals with Bani Israel. And the second half overwhelmingly deals with the Muslim Ummah. And the first, the point of it all is that one nation has been, its, its crimes have been listed and Allah Azza wa Jal gives very convincing reasons for why they no longer deserve the status of being the highest Ummah, the chosen Ummah. And once He gives those reasons, then He justifies why there is a need for a new nation to be a role model for humanity and that is how we are, the Muslim Ummah is inaugurated. But before this transition happens, so, so Allah Azza wa Jal talks about Bani Israel actually, He began first saying all human beings were honored because the first human being is mentioned, that is Adam alayhi salam. In some sense, he was chosen over all other creation. Then within his children, a nation was chosen over all other nations, that is Bani Israel. So the kalam, the speech begins about Bani Israel. And it goes on for some time. And Allah Azza wa Jal also lists in between the lines, as they say in Arabic, in Labiba min al yafham, in between the lines they say that the reason for which they don't accept Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is because he's not from the children of Israel. He's not from the children of that line. He's from the children of Ismail, it's the other line. So he's not from us, how can Prophethood come to, uh, to him? We have a copyright. We have a trademark on prophethood, so it can't come outside our family. So what Allah does subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the end of that conversation, He says, okay, well He's not from your family. Is Ibrahim from your family? He basically poses that question to them. So a conversation begins about Ibrahim alayhi salam. And within Ibrahim alayhi salam's conversation, really awesome, something really awesome happens. Within his children, the child that they believe in the most, the one that they take pride in the most is Yaqub alayhi salam. The Jews, they take the most pride in Yaqub alayhi salam. The reason for that is, the other name of Yaqub is Israel. That's the name they have for their entire nation. They call themselves the children of Israel. I mean, you could say they, call, they should call themselves the children of Ibrahim. But they don't. They call themselves the children of Israel. So what specifically Allah mentions about Ibrahim alayhi salam is a couple of things. One thing He mentions, you need louder mic? Okay, all right. So one thing he mentions, yeah this is a lot better, is that Yaqub alayhi salam was reaching his deathbed. He was about to die. And he gathered all of his children. How many children did Yaqub alayhi salam have? Twelve. So he gathers all of his kids and he's at his deathbed. 
And Allah asked the question, Am kuntum shuhada in hadara Ya'qub al maut Were you witness when death presented itself to Ya'qub, when death came to Ya'qub? إِذْ قَالَ لِبَنِيهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي When he said to his children, who are you going to be worshipping after me? Now you might be thinking, this talk is supposed to be about Ramadan, what does this have to do with Ramadan? Just wait and see. Just wait and see, it's all connected. So Ya'qub, whose other name is what again? Israel is talking to his children and saying, I'm about to die, what will you do after I'm gone? So his children say, قَالُوا نَعْبُدُ إِلَٰهَكَ وَإِلَٰهَ آبَائِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَ... Ismaila. Uh oh His own children said, we will be on the same religion as your fathers, Ibrahim and Ismail. In other words, Jews accuse Ismail alayhi salam of being someone we don't take from. He's Ma'adullah, they even call him the illegitimate child of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's what they said about him. His own children, Israel's own children said, we will follow the legacy of Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq. Before they even mention their own grandfather, they mention their grandfather's brother, Ismail alayhi salam. They mention him first. Ilahan wahidan is only going to be, this, that's all one God, it's not different religions. Is one ilah, but they added something very interesting. Now I want you to keep in mind, when we say the children of Israel, we think of a nation. But the people around the bed of Yaqub alayhi salam are the actual children of Israel. These are his sons. When we use Bani Israel now, we're talking about their children's 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 children. It's like several lines down. But these are the original sons of Israel. What words came out of their mouth? They said, وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ We are going to be Muslim only for Allah. The sons of Israel said that we are going to be Muslims. The word Islam came out of their mouth. Allah reminds the Jews that Islam is not something, why are you saying this is new to you? Your own father, you say you will follow the legacy of your fathers? Fine. Your fathers said that they will follow the legacy of Ismail also. Actually, they mentioned Ismail before they even mentioned Ishaq, and they said that they're going to be Muslims. So what's the hold up? <laughs> what's the problem now? وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ So first they're introduced to Ibrahim alayhi salam in this way. So they understand that their criticism that Muhammad Allah, salam, is not from our family. Allah says, yes, he is from your family. He's from Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's from Ismail. And if you're thinking Ismail is not worth much, well your old children thought, your own father thought he was worth a lot. They honored him first. Now, another point. <clears throat> Allah didn't just tell us about that dua. Allah went on and told us something else very critical about Ibrahim alayhi salam in this conversation. He told us, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ سَمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ When Ibrahim alayhi salam was raising the foundations of the house along with Ismail, what house was he building? The Kaaba. So now the Jews even recognize that Ibrahim built a house. Even they recognize. And they're being told this house was built with, not with the help of Ishaq, but with the help of Ismail. Now Ismail obviously went to the Arab land, so they know that if he built it with Ismail, it can't be somewhere else, it has to be in Arabia. The house has to be in Arabia. And then after that, it is that Allah Azza wa Jal reveals, سَيَقُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَاللَّهُ مَعْنَ قِبْلَتِهِمْ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا The idiots, the fools are going to say, how come they changed their qibla? Muslim used to pray before Kaaba, which, which direction did we used to pray in? Al-Aqsa, which means we, we accepted the capital of the Jews as our capital. They, that is their capital. That's what they thought of it as. The qibla is a capital. So we prayed in that direction, so we accepted their capital as our capital. But when Allah changed the Qibla, He didn't just change it. First He said, Ibrahim built it and then He revealed the ayah to change the Qibla. And so now the Muslims are praying in a different direction. When the Muslims started praying in a different direction, what we learn in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is that the members of Bani Israel, the Jewish community, was really angry. They were very offended. They actually started complaining. Ma wallahu! What turned them around? Why did they turn the other way? An qiblatihim, and from their qibla. See, they didn't even say an qiblatina. What turned them away from our qibla? They said, what turned them away from their qibla? It's your qibla too, guys. Aqsa is yours. You know, the, you know what that tells us? Deep down inside, they knew the Prophet is true. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They knew, and they knew if this direction changes, all of a sudden, Allah has decided to honor the sons of Ismail, because the sons of Ishaq have lost it. They, way, they messed up way too much, so they couldn't accept that. To make this point a little clearer, I'll review something I've shared with you before. 
A non-Muslim sees you praying at the airport. If, you, if a non-Muslim sees you praying at the airport, whether you're praying northeast, southwest, you're praying left, right, you know, three guys praying in three different directions, do they have a problem with that? They don't care. Like these Muslims, you know, why is this guy praying to a chair? I don't understand. Now whether you face the window, the chair, the wall, it doesn't matter to them. They wouldn't be offended by your change of direction. Why? Because that's not your religion. That's not their religion. That's not their, this is none of their business. The fact that the Jews of Medina were so offended that the Qibla changed. What does that tell you? They knew this is the right religion. They knew it. And they got very upset about it. And by being upset, they showed their own foolishness. So Allah says, Sayaqul as-Sufaha. Lam yaqul Sayaqul al-Yahud. He didn't say the Jews said, he said that the fools said, because they gave it up. Why did they turn their direction? Then Allah says, قُلْ لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءِ إِلَىٰ صِرَاتٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Tell them, Allah owns the east and the west. He guides whoever He wants to a straight path. Wonderful. Allah guides them. Allah tells them, Allah does what He wants. He has the authority to change the capital. Now, you know when a, a, a nation is formed, or a nation is freed, then they declare a capital. And when they declare a capital, they are then, you know, the flag is raised, and they are officially declared a new country. Right? You can't have a country until you have a what? A capital. So this capital is now declared, the new capital of Islam is Mecca. Which means now officially we are a new nation. So it's very logical that the next ayat in the surah are, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا That is how we made you a middle nation. Congratulations. You are a new nation. Allah Azza wa gave us that honor. He made us a new nation. Now that we are a new nation, the question arises, is it only the Qibla that makes us a new nation? Or is it something deeper? Is there something else? Salat was there before. Salat was there before. As a matter of fact, fasting was there before too. Jews had fasting also. They had Salat also. They had Salat also. But something is new about this nation. They have been given the final message of Allah. And I'll ask you a simple question, you all, you all know the answer to it. What month was the final book of Allah revealed? Ramadan. The Jews accept the Torah, they refuse to accept the Qur'an. This is a new nation, and the reason it's a new nation is it has the final book. So that month in which it was revealed should be the month of celebration. To celebrate us as a new nation. And the reason for which you should celebrate this new month is because this is the month of the Qur'an, the month that made you a new nation. So the first thing that makes us a new nation is the change of Qibla. The second thing that makes us a new nation is we should, we should officially inaugurate a commemoration ceremony of the Qur'an and Allah declares that to be Ramadan. So now we finally get to these ayat. We get to these ayat. The point of these ayat in, the, in, in their history was to put things in perspective. You people are a new nation and you should celebrate being the honored nation of Allah and that celebration's name is Ramadan. We, when we think of celebration nowadays, we think of Eid. Right? Eid is another celebration. Actually before that celebration, the, the true celebration is actually Ramadan itself. For a lot of Muslims today, because our understanding of the religion has deteriorated so much, Ramadan is like the first three days are celebration, then it's exhaustion, and then inshallah, oh, he's coming, okay, okay. A couple more days, it's over, it's almost over. You know? But Ramadan itself is supposed to be the celebration. Now, as we get into the ayat, before Allah gave us Ramadan, and the ayah, I told you there's one ayah of Ramadan in the Quran. One ayah of Ramadan and fasting, or the, the month of Ramadan. But there's an ayah of fasting before it too. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. Ayyam al-ma'adudat. Those, those two ayat before it are about fasting also. But they are about fasting by most scholars' opinions that don't have to do with Ramadan itself. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum. Fasting is made mandatory on you just like it was on those who came before you. Just like it was mandated on those who came before you. In other words, your days of fasting and the Jews' days of fasting are the same days. Originally, the Prophet ﷺ used to fast the same days as the Jews used to fast. 
كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Just like that. The format of the fasting was the same. But now you have to have a new month. So the new month was in the next ayah, no, no, no. Not like them anymore. The next ayah comes and says, no. It's not going to be ayyama ma'dudat, a few days. Ma'dudat in Arabic means, it's called jam'u qilla, means less than 10 days. There are about 9 days they used to fast. Right? That's it. It was less. But we know Ramadan is how many days of fasting? It's 30 days. So Allah says, shahru Ramadan, next ayah, shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. Before I go further, all of us, alhamdulillah, we've experienced the month of Ramadan in our life, multiple times. What is the first thing that comes in the mind of the average Muslim when they think of Ramadan? Fasting. fasting. Actually, uh, no, not fasting. Suhoor and iftar. <laughs> the two things that come to the mind of a Muslim, oh, pakora time. <laughs> you know, it's going to be good. That's what comes to our mind. You know? What is, the, what is the first thing Allah wanted us to know about Ramadan? Shahru Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al Quran. The first thing he told us about the ayah, the month of Ramadan is the one in which the Qur'an was sent down. There's no mention of what yet? Fasting. There's no mention of fasting. The only thing, this is a month, the Qur'an came down in it. So now the Muslim knows, the thing that makes us different, that Qur'an, that incredible gift of Allah, that was revealed in this month, this month is better than every other month. Automatically. This book is better than all previous revelation. It's the ultimate revelation, the final revelation of Allah Azza wa Jal. This month must be the best month of all. There's no fasting, he knows about it yet. The Muslim hasn't even heard about the fasting yet, but he knows this is the best month. Now maybe the next words are gonna tell us about fasting. Shahru Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al Quran, Hudallin Nas. Quran is a guidance for people. The conversation is no longer about Ramadan, the conversation is about the Qur'an. The Qur'an is so important in this ayah that the subject of the, the month of Ramadan is stopped. Shahru Ramadan, the month, the discussion about Ramadan stopped. And the conversation began about the Qur'an itself. You should get reintroduced to the Qur'an. And let me tell you what Allah says about the Qur'an in this ayah. Number one, He says, Hudan lil nas. It's a guidance for people. Do Muslims already know that? Yes. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَىٰ It has multiple proofs and multiple clear teachings that come from guidance. Do Muslims already know that? Yes. وَالْفُرْقَانِ And it makes a dis distinction between right and wrong. It, it, it dictates a criteria, a standard between right and wrong. Do Muslims already know that? Yes. Everything Allah said about the Qur'an in this ayah is something the Muslims already knew or didn't know. They already knew. What is Allah telling us? When this month comes, it's almost as though you are getting reintroduced to the Qur'an. It's like you're coming to the Qur'an for the first time all over again. Every time. You should feel like you just became a new Muslim Ummah. Every Muslim should feel like he just became a Muslim. You know when somebody just becomes a Muslim, they really want to read the Qur'an. I just want to read, what does it say? What does God say to me? There's a curiosity, right? Allah wants us to have that fresh, take on the Qur'an every single month. Every single month of Ramadan. We have to gear up, not for just the fasting, not just to get the foods. Most of us end up gaining weight in Ramadan, not losing weight. You know? We have to gear up for our appetite for the Qur'an itself. This year, I will be introduced to the Qur'an like I've never been introduced before. I will recite the Qur'an like I've never recited it before. I will read the same ayat like I've never read them before. This is the beauty of these ayat. The Jews believed that their book was guidance for all of mankind? No. They believed that their Torah was guidance only for them. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an, hudan linnas. Not this time. You new nation, you don't get to keep it for yourself. This will be a guidance for everyone. So you know what those words mean? Allah didn't just say, hudan lakum. It's guidance for you people. He said, hudan linnas. You know what that means? This month I will learn the Qur'an, I will reintroduce myself to it, but I know for a fact, this book will not walk itself over to the people, who will have to give it to the people? You and I will. Because it is guidance not just for you and me, it is guidance for the people. The month of Ramadan is a reminder that we have to share Qur'an with humanity. Just in the words, Hudan nas 
When you share the Qur'an with humanity, they ask for proof. They ask, why do you believe this is the word of God? What's your proof? What's your evidence? Give me something. Don't they say that? Allah says in the next words, very logical, وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ Bayinat means proofs, clear evidences that come from guidance. Not only does it guide people, it proves to them that this is the guidance too. You don't have to come up with some outside evidence, the evidence is inside the Qur'an. Anybody with decency, human decency is going to see that. They're going to come to this book with the right intention, and they will find guidance and the proofs that this is guidance. It will validate that for them. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ And once they accept those proofs, it will tell them which way is wrong and which way is right. Wal Furqan. It will separate right and wrong for them. So it started with a guide, an invitation for people, a guidance for people. It will prove itself to them. And once it proves itself to them, they will pick the right way from the wrong way because it will draw a line for them. Don't do this and do this. Live this way and don't live this way. Subhanallah. This is the awesome power of the Qur'an. But the, the ayah did not begin with the Qur'an. The ayah began with the month of Ramadan. Now Allah says, okay, now let's go back to the month. After this introduction, He says, okay, let's go, let's talk about the month of Ramadan again. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ Then whoever among you witnesses the month, whoever is around lives to see the month, is very beautiful. He didn't say, فَصُومُوهُ فَصُومُوهُ Then fast in it. He said, whoever witnessed the month, you know the people who become a Muslim, you know what they're called? When, when they take their, when they accept Islam, what's they called? Taking what? Shahada. Shahada. When the believers, when the followers of Isa alayhi salam believed in him, they made dua, they asked Isa alayhi salam, ask Allah, فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ So you should be witnesses against people. The idea of witnessing the truth. When somebody takes shahada, it's like they're a new Muslim. They just became Muslim. Allah says, you will be witnesses to the month. The month itself will be your shahada. You will be testifying to the month. Subhanallah. What that means for us is, and the other thing here is, if you live to see the month. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ What it means is, if you live to see the month. If you're around. In other words, you know how sometimes the imam makes dua, Allahumma rzuqna shahra Ramadan. Oh Allah, give us in our provision, in our risk, give us the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is not cheap. You have to earn it. It may be that Allah decides, you don't get this month of Ramadan, I don't get this month of Ramadan, and our day comes before we even get there. So if you are lucky enough, you are gifted enough by Allah, that you got to see the month of Ramadan, then you should celebrate. You should celebrate. You should be so happy that you got to see another Ramadan, and here's how you celebrate. فَلْيَصُمْهُ then you should fast in it. Allah's declaration of celebration is fasting. It's fasting. Did you know that all prophets before they received revelation, they fasted? Allah called them to fast. And we are supposed to, as now we are the guardians of that revelation, if we really want to internalize that revelation, we also have to what? Fast. There's a relationship between taking the Qur'an in your heart and fasting. Allah made that connection Himself. There will, something will happen. If you come to the month of Ramadan in order to get closer to the Qur'an, and of course you're fasting at the same time, there will be a connection created. Your body will starve and your soul will feed. It's gonna be awesome. Usually we, we feed our body and we starve our souls. Right? But this month we're gonna starve the body and we're gonna feed the soul. So it's gonna be balanced. The, the 11 months of imbalance will be balanced again. This is, this is the opportunity we've been given. فَلْيَصُمْهُ now, did we fast before Ramadan came? Did the Muslims fast before Ramadan came? Yes. yes. And Allah gave some rules. Allah said, if you are sick, this is before Ramadan, if you get sick, then you can make up the days. فَعِدَّةٌ مِّنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ But maybe you're not sick, and you don't want to make it up. You can pay some fidya. فَفِدْيَةٌ وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ The one who has the power to fast, doesn't want to fast, but he can afford it, he can just give a miskin some food, he can feed a miskin, and he can pay for his fasting that way. This was the rule <coughs> before Ramadan. So you had two ways of making up a fast. What are the two ways of making up a fast? One? No, what's the first way? You make it up. First way, you make it up. Second way? You give fidya. 
And how many days did we used to fast? Nine. Nine. So there were three things that were easy about fasting before Ramadan. You can make it up, you can give fidya, and it's just nine days. Ramadan came. Ramadan has its own rules. Allah says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ لَا, لا فَلْيَصُمْ فِيهِ Whoever witnesses the month should fast it, not fast in it. If I say I fast in Ramadan, it means I fast some days of Ramadan. If I say I fast Ramadan, what does that mean? The whole Ramadan. So now it's not nine days, it's how many? 30 days or give or take. Right, 30 days. So it's harder or easier now? Number one, it's harder. Number one, it's harder. If you miss a fast, well, how many options did you have originally? You had two options. What were the two options? Who remembers? Make it up or? Pay fidya. Now Allah says, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةٌ مِّنَ يَامٍ أُخَرْ Whoever was sick or was traveling, he has to make it up in other days. And the Muslims are thinking, وَعَلَىٰ الَّذِينَ يُتِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ تَعَوِنَ No, no more. And the one who wants to afford it, give some sadaqah and get out of it? No, no, that option is not there anymore. Now it's more days and if you miss it, you have to make it up. Is it easier or harder? Ah, so it's, it got harder in multiple ways. It's more days, they're all together, they're all together, and you have to make them up if you miss. There's no option, there's no other option also. Man! And when you made it harder, somebody might be listening to that and go, man, Ramadan is going to be hard. The Muslims of that time, might be think, somebody might be thinking, I don't know, this was easier before, now it got harder. Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ وَالْيُسْرِ كَمْ جَمِيلًا هَذَا الْكَلَامُ he, how beautiful, he knows what we're thinking before we even say it. He says, Allah wants ease for you. Allah, just because you, start, you, you might start thinking it's gonna be hard, he says, Allah wants ease for you. Wala yuridu bikum al usr And he doesn't want difficulty for you. He doesn't want difficulty for you. And by the way, if I say to my child, I want ease for you. I want things to be easy for you. Then I don't have to say, and I don't want things to be difficult for you. Because if I just say, I want ease for you, that means the same thing. But if my child is really worried, and I want to give him a lot of encouragement, I say, I want things to be easy for you, I don't want them to be hard for you at all. I say it like, it's, it's like I said it twice. It's like I said it twice, that's what Allah did in Ramadan. It's going to be, Allah wants things to be easy for you, He doesn't want things to be hard for you. He doesn't want things to be hard for you. But here is where we're going to talk about some really important stuff inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully I can wrap it up rather quickly. I know you've had a 10 hour marathon. So, but uh, uh, there's some really important things I'd like to highlight for you inshallah. You all know what taqwa means, yes? What does taqwa mean? Please don't say fear of God. <coughs> Consciousness. Wiqaya, the original word wiqaya means protection. Taqwa actually means to protect yourself. Protect yourself. If you're, if you're wearing a bulletproof vest, you're engaged in an act of taqwa. If you pack your bags properly before you go on a journey, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِي taqwa. That's also taqwa. Like you took your passport and you make sure you had enough money for the journey, etc. etc. That's also a form of taqwa. Why? Because you're protecting yourself from landing into trouble. Taqwa with Allah is, I'm gonna protect myself from doing sins, from looking in the wrong direction, from saying the wrong thing from wasting my time, this is also taqwa. Taqwa is mentioned a couple of hundred times in the Qur'an. A couple of hundred times Allah talks about taqwa. If Allah talks about taqwa that many times, actually let me not finish that sentence. How many people here have teenage kids? Teenage kids? Okay. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Irving is about to erupt. Give it five years. All these little, little monkeys we got running around, they're all going to be teenagers. Those are scary times. Those are scary times. My kids and your kids. The average age here is very young. But give it five years. Oh my goodness. Then they're going to be teenagers. And people are, when I say, how many people have teenagers? There's going to be people crying. Look how I have teenagers. You know? You know? How many times you got to tell your teenager to do the homework? Oh my God. Do your homework. Do your homework. Do your homework. Did you do your homework? Did you do homework? You're gonna do it, right? Okay. Just say, hey, uh, by the way, do it. <laughs> Why do you have to tell him so many times? If you tell the, if, you, if I came over at your house as a guest and you keep telling your child, do your homework, I, t I stop you and I say, why do you tell him so many times? And you say, what, what do you say? 
Because he doesn't do it. He doesn't listen. And then I have to say, you know what? You're the father, you're the mother, you know him better. You know him better. So the fact that you're repeating so much, you must know what you're doing. Allah repeats taqwa a couple of hundred times in the Qur'an. Does that tell you something? Who's he talking to? You and me. اِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ اِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ اِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ فَاتَّقُوهُ He keeps saying it, he keeps saying it, he keeps saying it. What, what does that mean logically? Uh, we don't really do it. <coughs> if we did it, you, how many times do you have to mention it? Done. Done. And let me give you a proof. Allah says fast in Ramadan. One time in Qur'an. One time. Muslims fast generally or no? Oh man. He didn't have to tell us a hundred times, fast in Ramadan, fast in Ramadan, fast in Ramadan, it's done, finish. Done deal. He says have taqwa, hundreds of times. So which one is harder, fasting in Ramadan or taqwa? Oh, taqwa is hard. Taqwa is hard. Now, I told you there are two ayat. There's the ayat about Ramadan, uh, Ramadan itself. But there's an ayah before it about fasting. There's an ayah before about fasting. So before I finish the ayah about Ramadan, I want to tell you something about fasting itself. Allah says, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ You were given fasting so you could get taqwa. Basically, the premise of the ayah is, you can develop fasting, hopefully, you can develop taqwa, hopefully by the act of fasting. <coughs> What is the, what's the connection between me not drinking and eating and developing taqwa? Not drinking and eating is something physical. Yes? You feel the effects of it physically or spiritually? Physically. But taqwa is something physical or spiritual? Ah, so Allah says do something physical and you will have spiritual effects. Isn't that what He's saying? So we have to understand how can this be? We have to figure this out. Listen. If you fasted before, and all of you have, it's a hot day. You're with your coworker, and he's gulping like gul, 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 like next to you. And you're looking at him drink, and your throat is begging. Your throat is screaming at you. Just take some water. You're starving. You're starving, and you're you know right before iftar time, right before you're sitting at the table, you can hear the fries frying. You know, and the the fruit chart is being put on the table. You're looking at it. Actually, you're looking at that and the clock, and you're looking at that and the clock. It's like the playoffs <laughs> in the last few seconds. That's what you're doing. It's time, right? It's in your hand. It's here. It's time, right? It's time, right? It's time. <laughs> oh no, that clock is off. Oh God, I hate that. But you know what? You're in anticipation. But your stomach is hungry before the bell rings, or no? Your stomach says, I want, I want food, give me. Your throat says, I want drink, give me. But your heart says, hey, throat, shut up. <laughs> Not until Maghrib. Your stomach says, I want food, and you tell your, your heart that fears Allah more, that heart becomes stronger and learns to tell the belly, hey, no. Not until Maghrib. There's a fight going on inside you. For 30 days, there's a fight going in, on inside me. And for 30 days, my heart wins. For 30 days I beat my stomach, and I beat my throat, and I beat my eyes, and I beat my ears. I beat them. The ear says, come on, a couple of songs, oh, no big deal. Just one movie, the eye says. No, it's Ramadan. Even those of you that are like addicted to movies, you'd cut it down in Ramadan. No bro, it's Ramadan bro, I, I can't do it. You guys, some of you guys go to parties and stuff. Not the halal kind. Not those kind. But in Ramadan you cut it down. Your feet say, hey, come on, let's go. Your hand gets jittery with the car keys. You say, no, nah, it's Ramadan. Your heart says, no, Ramadan, we're off. We're off duty this month. Not gonna do it. There's a battle going on inside you, and for 30 days, Allah gives you the power to win. For 30 days. You know, and if anybody's ever joined a workout program, lose weight in 30 days, get ripped in 45 days, you know, to become a monster in 80 days, whatever. You know, whatever it may be, what happens to most people? 
They, fought, they watched the first episode, come on, stay with me, stay with me, and what happens after that? Yeah. <sighs> I need a donut. <laughs> They're done after one day. Do Muslims quit fasting after one day? No. They stay 30 days. If they just understood why they're fasting, because my, my belief is most Muslims don't understand why they're fasting. They forgot that they're fasting in order to build taqwa. If they remembered that, if they understood that, if I remembered that, then my heart has been trained for 30 days to defeat the rest of my, my temptations. All of them. I have my heart, but the taqwa of Allah has won for 30 days. That's what you call a training program. That's a training program. And in the, during training, you know, fire departments have training, police departments have training, military has training. And during training, they will pretend like the building's on fire and you have to go in there or whatever. Or they'll have like these fake, like, uh, uh, you know, fake criminals pointing guns at you and you have to shoot at them or whatever. But during training, they don't actually put you in front of a criminal shooting at you. During training, it's easier for you, yes? So the real challenges are not given to you. You're given similar situations, but it's made easier for you because even though firefighter is not actually fighting a fire. Simulation. Simulation. The pilot is flying the plane on software before he goes up in the air. You understand? Now, does Allah take and make something easy for us so, so this fight is a little easier this month? So we can develop this muscle before it's crushed? What does he do with shaitan? Locks him up for 30 days. So that, you know, this training is without distractions. It's easier, you can build this on your own. And now that you're done, go. Go. 11 months, deal with shaitan. And after 11 months, a, a war is going on between me and shaitan. Actually between two, my heart, who's already been trained by shaitan, who's already been listening to shaitan for a long time, <coughs> only got one month training, then he's back on the battlefield for 11 months. Is, he gonna be, is the heart going to be injured in 11 months? So you need to come back for more training. For more healing. You know, the hearts are allowed to heal in Ramadan. For 30 days. It's our 30 day shaitan vacation. That's what that is. It's, it's beautiful. It's so brilliant that Allah Azza wa Jal gave us that. The connection between fasting and building taqwa. You understand this? So let me just finish the ayah about the Qur'an and I'll share with you the, 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 the hint that Allah gave us. Okay. Allah Azza wa Jal says, يُرِدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةِ And I gave you this month so that you may complete the count. لِي لَامَ الْعِلَّةِ They call it, is, the, answers the question why. Why did you tell us the whole month? So you may complete the full training period, the full 30 days. How many of you are in a work that requires some kind of certification? Right, you have to have a 30 day training, a 20 day training, whatever. If you leave after 10 days, you don't get your certificate. It's not enough. You're not ready. If you want to get that certificate that your heart is strong enough, then you have to finish the full 30 days. And by the way, whenever one of you earns a certificate, do you celebrate or no? I just got Cisco certified, back in the day I got MCSE certified, remember that some of you techies? Right? I just learned cold fusion, cold fusion is cold and dead now, right? I learned this language or that language, I got certified in this and I got certified in that, there's a celebration isn't it? Celebrations ha happens before you finish your training or after you finish your training? First, finish your training, لِتُكْمِلُوا idda. Once you finish your training, you should celebrate. When Muslims celebrate, what do they scream? Somebody gets their diploma, what do you hear? Takbir! Allah says, hadakum." So that you may declare the greatness of Allah, which is the Quranic expression for <coughs> celebrate out loud. What happens at Eid? What are we reciting as we're walking to the Musalla? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, SubhanAllah. It's beautiful. We're celebrating that we finished our training. It's not a time to be sad. You would think, oh, Ramadan is over, we should be sad. Allah tells us, no, it's ha we should be happy. Have an upbeat attitude. Based on how He guided you, I will even teach you how to celebrate. <coughs> and what that, some scholars say what that means is, you know how we're supposed to take a different road to the Eid prayer. 
and we're supposed to, you know, what we're supposed to do when we wake up, we're supposed to eat sweets in particular Eid, you know, and we're supposed to do these takabir and recite them out loud. This is the guidance of Allah. Allah even taught you how to celebrate. Not just how to party, but how to party. But at the end of it all, He adds, وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ And hopefully, maybe, and as a result, so that all of you will become grateful. The, last con the second last conversation, I'll be honest with you guys, the second last conversation I want to have with you is, why does Allah say at the end of this ayah, so that you should be grateful? And the word la'allah is more comprehensive, it captures maybe you'll be grateful, hopefully you'll become grateful, also means so that you become grateful. You know what that means? That means even if you fast the entire month, it doesn't guarantee that you'll become grateful. But the hope is there. The hope is there. The best case scenario is this, does everybody who, go through, who goes through an entire program graduate? Don't answer that question, certain students. Somebody goes through an entire program, it's not guaranteed that they graduate, yes? So there are the, the eventual outcome of Ramadan is that you should be grateful. The question is, like Shaykh al-Sha'awabi says, ashukru ala ni'mah. Shukr is, exists when you respond to a favor. You don't thank anyone unless something good is done to you. The question then is, what are we thanking Allah for at the end of Ramadan? There's a few things. What was the first gift? Shahu Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. We learn to be grateful for the Qur'an. The point of it, this whole exercise is, this month should be so full of Qur'an, you have such a new taste for the Qur'an in this month, that at the end of this month you say, I thank Allah for giving me the gift of the Qur'an. I'm so grateful for the Qur'an. The second gift, I thank Allah for giving me a month free of shaitan so I can recite the Qur'an in peace. فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ When you recite Qur'an, seek refuge of Allah from the shaitan. This month you get free access to the Qur'an. Distraction free access to the Qur'an. SubhanAllah, you should be grateful for that. You should be grateful that Allah allowed you to witness the entire month. It didn't take you before then. So these are the gifts that Allahum Tashkurun. Now the last part of my talk with you. I don't think I should take more than ten minutes for this. And that is the gift of Allah to the Muslims for Ramadan, in addition to this. Something Allah gave us as a bonus. You know, sometimes you complete your training and you get kind of gifts. You know, in addition to your diploma. This is the gift. Allah in the next ayah doesn't talk to us. He doesn't talk to us. He talks to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa idha sa'alaka ibadi, when his slave, when my slave, my slaves ask you about me. First of all, Allah didn't say if they ask you about me. Allah said when they ask you about me. In other words, Allah is waiting for us to ask. You know, a father who's hoping his son comes back. He doesn't say if my son comes back. <coughs> he says. When my son comes back. A father whose son is in the military on a mission. He's gone. He says in three months, when my son comes back, inshallah. He doesn't say if my son comes back. You understand? In the word when, there's hope. In the word if, there is actually kind of hopelessness. Allah says, when my slave asks you about me. In other words, Allah is waiting in this ayah for you to ask about him. Allah is waiting that his slave should ask about him. And they come and ask the Prophet ﷺ, Will Allah forgive me? Will Allah accept my dua? What does Allah love? What does Allah want from me? The Sahaba come and ask the Prophet ﷺ. Now what should you tell them? Allah said, now, who is Allah talking to in the ayah? What did I say? Who is Allah talking to? The Prophet ﷺ. Listen. In Arabic you then ex expect, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَقُلْ لَهُمْ إِنِّي قَرِيبٌ if my slaves ask you about me, then tell them, I am near. That's what you should tell them. Who should tell them? They, they came and asked the Prophet. So the Prophet should tell them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Isn't that true? <coughs> what does Allah do? Something incredible. When my slaves ask you about me, I'll talk to them directly, I am near. Allah didn't even ask the Prophet to tell them, Allah tells us Himself. He, in the middle of that conversation, it's as though He was waiting for the time that you would ask about Him, and when you would ask about Him, He will talk to you directly, and tell you directly in the Qur'an, I am near. I am so near, you don't even have to talk 
to, through the Prophet ﷺ, I'll talk to you directly, inni qareeb. The Prophet's not even mentioned anymore. And don't have any doubt about it, because inna is mentioned. As though you might think, really Allah is going to talk to me? I, Allah, I, I am near. Now, let me give you some examples so you appreciate what's happening here. How, if, I know we're in Irving, so a lot of techs, techies here. You work in a big corporation, by any chance? A big corporation? Okay. You have a CEO, he's got 500 employees. A thousand employees. Chances are you'll never meet him. High likelihood you will never meet the CEO of the company. And if you meet him, maybe you run into him. He's taking a tour of your campus or your office. And you kind of shake hands with him or talk to him. How long is that conversation going to be? Ten five seconds, maybe. In those five seconds, you're gonna, can I take a picture? That's what you're going to do. You know? But you, you don't get much time with somebody who's very important. And somebody who's responsible for a lot of people, the more they're responsible for, you, they're not close to you. What's the lowest job in the world? The lowest job. Like if you have the employer up here, I'll tell you, the lowest job is slave. So the biggest distance between the employer and an employee, the biggest distance is what? Master and? Slave. slave. Master will talk to the manager, he'll talk to the clerk, he'll talk to the regional director, da, 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 da. the bottom, the last person you might ever talk to would be the slave. Allah is the highest that can ever be. And we as ibad, as slaves are the lowest we can ever be. Logically speaking, that is the greatest distance. And Allah says, whenever this lowest one asks about the highest one, tell him I'm near. SubhanAllah. Tell him I'm near. I'm not far. Now tell me this. When you talk to somebody important, do you have to get an appointment? I, I don't like something Obama said in his speech. I should send him a message. I should call him. Am I going to get through? No. No. I'm not. When somebody's important, you can't get through. You know, one of my children, I wanted to take them to a specialist. And their specialists, you know, they have, uh, because there are one or two of them in Dallas, they, there's a waiting list. So I can't just walk into the office, I have to get an appointment, and they give you an appointment three months later, and if you miss it by 10 minutes, another three months. Because they're busy. That's not on my schedule, that is on their schedule. The more important someone is, the more busy their schedule is, and I have to make time for them, they don't make time for me. They don't make time for me. It would be really ridiculous of me that if I, want, if I met a great scholar, one of the world's great scholars, like for example, I had the chance to meet Shaykh uh, Malana Hassan uh, or Akram Nadwi, may Allah protect him, <coughs> in London. I was really honored to meet him, one of the great scholars of the world, great muhaddithin of the world. I'm not going to go to him and say, hey, by the way, you know, if you want to schedule an appointment to talk to me, here's my number. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. What, what are you thinking? Somebody's going to meet the president and tell him, hey, you know what, if you just give me a call, just leave a message, I'll get back to you when I can. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Who should make the appointment, the master or the slave? The slave should make the appointment. Allah says, Ujibu da'wa. I respond to the call. Da'wa tabda'i idha da'an. Whenever he calls me, I'll answer. Whenever he calls me, I will answer. The ayah began, I'm waiting for you to ask about me. Not, I'm not even waiting for you to talk to me. I'm waiting you, for you to, to ask about me, talk about me. I'm near. And then he goes on to say, you doesn't matter when you call me, I'll answer. Subhanallah. How, who's going to be more important than Allah? And who's going to have a lower status than you and me? And yet Allah says, I'm waiting for you anytime. Anytime. And I will respond immediately. By the way, astajibu qad yakhud waqtan. Astajibu, I'll respond over time. Ujibu fawran. Immediately, I will immediately respond. Immediately I will respond when he calls me. But there's something that happens in the middle that I want to share with you and I'm done in this particular ayah. This is the gift. This is the gift, this ayah. Allah says, Ujibu da'wata da'i. I respond to the call, the call of the caller. There's a difference between saying, I respond to the call of any caller. As opposed to saying, I respond to the call of the caller. When you say any caller, a caller, is the caller known or not known? Not known. When you say the caller, 
Is the caller known or not known? Known. Allah, how many people calling Allah? So many. He has the, you know, if anybody else, if all of you were asking a question, I would say a, a person asked, because I got a written question, I don't know where it came from. One of the students asked, it's anonymous. Allah says, none of you are anonymous. All of you are not an A, you are a V. You are a V. Allah knows you particularly. I will respond to your call individually. He's not just going to say, oh, a slave from Texas called. Made dua. No, that one, that one right there, he called. He made that dua. It's very particular. That because of the al, ad-da'i. Because of ad-da'i. Then Allah didn't say, ujibu dua ad-da'i. He said, ujibu da'wat ad-da'i. This is the, the, it's called a mastar with a tamar buta. Mastar marra, they call it in Arabic grammar. I will call, even if this guy is not even used to making dua, once in a blue moon out of some crazy thing that happened in his life, he decided to make dua out of by accident. Even that guy, even if he called me one time, da'wata, not dua, dua could be regular, da'wa is one time. Even if he called me one time, I will answer him. So none of us can say, well I don't even pray, I'm so messed up, Allah is not gonna answer my dua. Allah says, you just try once. Just try me once, I'm waiting. Where are you? And then Allah here, subhanAllah, look at this. Allah said, I respond to the call of the... Actually I should translate, retranslate. I respond to the single call of the what? Caller. Tell me, when you say caller, Hey, Ya Allah, Rabbi, caller. Does that mean the caller is a certain standard? Could a caller be a good person or a bad person? Sure. Caller is a caller. A caller could be anybody. Allah didn't say, I respond to the call of the righteous one, the worshipping one, the good one, the knowledgeable one. He didn't put any conditions on the caller except that he is a caller. So it doesn't matter what, stage, what position you have. It doesn't matter how messed up or how good you are. This invitation is open. So long as you are a caller and to Allah you are not a caller you are the caller even if that's all you ever did you never made a single act of ibadah in your life you just decided to turn to Allah once he still respond ujibu da'wa tadda'i idha da'an so he adds idha da'an whenever he calls me whenever the whenever he does it it's up to him this ayah is one of the most beautiful ayat in the Quran about dua I'm not even finished with the ayah I can't but this ayah is one of the most beautiful ayat of dua in the Qur'an. Where is it mentioned? In the conversation about Ramadan. The conversation about Ramadan is not yet over. The next ayat are also about Ramadan. There are six ayat about Ramadan, or fasting generally. In the middle of that, Allah changed the subject and made the subject dua. What is, that tell, tell, what is Allah telling us? Urdu mein kehte na, aqal man ke liye ishara kafi hai. Right? What is Allah telling us? Make a lot of dua in Ramadan. Make a lot of dua in Ramadan. First thing, celebrate the Quran. Fast. And now that you're doing that, ask Allah. Ask Allah. Ask Allah. Keep asking. Keep asking. Might as well share a little bit with you about what happens next. In the same ayah. This is Allah's side. In every relationship, there are two sides. There is master and there is slave. So far Allah said, this is what I'm willing to do for you. This is what I'm willing to do for you. So now the next half of the ayah will be, what are you willing to do for me? It's not a one-way relationship. Then, they should at least try to respond to me. Allah used the word ujibu for himself. I respond immediately. He didn't say, Fal yujibuli. He says, Fal yastajibuli. Then they should at least try. Fal istifal hunaka muhawala. They should at least try. They should at least want. Hunaka talab kadalik. Is want in it. Tamanni. They should at least try to respond to me. Allah is not asking you to be perfect. Allah says, at least try, man. Just try. I'm giving you so much. All I'm asking for you is try. That's it. Want it. Do you at least want to respond to Allah? Responding to Allah means what? I'm asking you for a couple of things. I'm just asking you for very little. 
Very little. Just respond. And Allah already told us, and you might say, oh, what Allah wants from me is too hard. It's too difficult. That's already taken care of. You need Allah who become al yusr wala you need become al asr. Qad mada. That's already done. Just take the call already. <laughs> and let it run out of taqwa. Be too religious to stick your hand in your pocket. Don't be that guy. That guy who's like salat is going on, his phone's ringing, he's got like 50 cent on the, on the ringtone. But he's way too religious to stick his hand in his pocket and turn it off. Because he's hoping, hope maybe they'll blame the guy next to me. Maybe they'll blame the guy next to me. So the moment salat is done, he'll give some innocent person a dirty look like. <laughs> Don't be that guy. Just turn it off. Please. Please. Just turn it off. Even if you just pick it up and say, I'm in a lecture right now. You know? Some people are amazing. Some people pick it up. First row. First row. They pick it up and they start talking. <laughs> I've been in classes. Of like 800 people. Guy in the front row gets a phone call. How many you doing? I stopped the lecture. I'm just looking at him. And he's like... <laughs> I was like, okay, you win. I can't beat that. <laughs> I can't beat that one. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا bi. I'll conclude, inshaAllah. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا bi. They should try to respond to me. And they should continue to believe in me. Believe that I'm listening to this dua. You know, a person gets depressed. They start thinking, Allah's not listening to my dua. I keep making dua, nothing's changing. At the end of the ayah of dua, Allah puts what we really need. Just believe in me. I know I'm listening immediately. Believe this ayah. Believe what Allah is telling you. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ And if you can really believe in that, you will be living a straight life so that they may be set straight. You will have a guided life. You will stay away from trouble in your life. Allah Azza wa Jal said, fasting gives taqwa. Ramadan gives gratitude. And dua sets you straight. You know, three, three connections made. Fasting gives what? Taqwa. Ramadan, Ramadan does what? What does Ramadan do? Makes you grateful. La'allakum tashkurun. And dua, what does dua do? Sets you in the straight direction. If you, if you feel like you don't have guidance in life, you know what you're missing? Dua. You're missing dua in life. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a people of dua before and especially during Ramadan and after Ramadan. May Allah Azza wa Jal make this truly a month of Quran for all of us. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive our shortcomings in previous months of fasting. And may Allah Azza wa Jal give us the strength, the energy, the concentration to listen to the beautiful recitation of the Quran the entire month of Ramadan. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us, pa give us patience with each other and not allow little things to distract us from what we're really here to do at the house of Allah. Barakallahu li walakum fil القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. If you guys can, please do sign up for the Amazed Conference. I just met Imam Suhaib, you know, uh, yesterday when I uh, when I was in Boston. He's really excited to come. Myself, uh, Sheikh Abdul Nasir, and Imam Suhaib are going to be presenting, as was mentioned before. They have tickets outside, but if you can check out the website, I would really appreciate it. And more Irving folks, not only do I like you to sign up. I would like you to talk to friends and family about it. InshaAllah ta'ala. Amazedbythequran.com. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.